Okay, guys, are we almost ready for chapel? Are you guys almost ready? Lizzie, are you ready? Tony, are you ready? Wait a minute. Who is that sneaking in on the screen this morning? What, what are you doing, you silly fox? Oh my goodness. Hey guys, I did not know that my little friend here, mm-hmm, my little friend here was sneaking in. Oh my goodness, tell him hey. You know how sneaky fox are, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you were sneaking in the screen, weren't you? Yeah. <laughs> well, you're a pretty fox. Yeah. And tell me what your name is. Frederick. Frederick the fox. Well, that that's a mighty pretty name. Looks like you've been hanging out with Bailey a little bit. Looks like there's a little Bailey slobber going on. Is that right? Yeah. Is Bailey your friend? Yeah, I think Bailey loves you a whole lot. Yeah. All right, well, why don't you go hang out and let's have story time and calendar time and prayer time. Are you ready? Yeah? Okay. Thanks for being here. Tell the boys and girls bye. Okay. Mwah. Sweet baby. All right, you can sit right here and watch chapel, okay? We'll do just fine. We'll be a good fox. No more of that sneaky stuff. Okay. All right. Wow. You just never know what's going to happen in our school room, right? <laughs> Okay, so we've got microphone, we've got camera. I think all is good for the moment. So let's get started with our pledges. Are you ready? Are you ready, Frederick? Here we go. Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good job, good job, good job, good job, good job. All right, how about our Christian flag? Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands. One Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again with life and liberty to all who believe. Good job. And now for our Bible. Here we go. Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, and will hide its words in my heart, that I may not sin against God. Good job. Get it on your shoulders. Here we go. Because I know you all brought your Bibles, right? The, come on. <clears throat> the, 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 come on. The, B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the word of God. The B-I-B-L-E spells Bible. Good job. Hey, how about, um, can we do J-O-Y, lightning fast? Are you ready? J-O-Y, down in my heart, deep, deep down in my heart, woo! J-O-Y, down in my heart, deep, deep down in my heart, woo! Jesus came to me, and no one can destroy, destroy, destroy it, yeah! J-O-Y, down in my heart, deep, deep down in my, deep, deep down in my, deep, deep down in my heart, woo! Good job! Well, that was kind of fast. I mean, it wasn't the fastest we've done it, but it was kind of fast. All right. So, let's see here. Um, let me check here. Oh, but we have comments. Oh, there's Juliana and Colleen. Good morning, ladies. How are you? I see that you've been here for a few minutes. I'm so sorry. I was so carried away. I wasn't paying attention. All right. So, now we've done our calendar. How about, let's do the weather. Now, the girls have told us, let me see here. Um, sunny and cold. Yep. So, Sunny and cold. We're already there. It's kind of the way it's been lately, right? Now, what day is today? If it's not Monday. Oh, well, yesterday was Tuesday. Wednesday! That's right. Today is Wednesday. So, let's find our today is. Oh, there it is. Today is, for all of my friends out there learning English, today is, and we're going to find Wednesday right here. Today is. Wednesday, right there. 
So if today is Wednesday, what was yesterday? What was the day before today? Yesterday was, and it's was because it's past tense, right? Yesterday, that was the day before today, was, because it's in the past, Yesterday was Tuesday, because today is Wednesday, so yesterday was Tuesday. Good job. And if today is Wednesday, what is tomorrow? We're going from Wednesday to the next day, Thursday. So tomorrow will be. Will be is future tense, right? It's not yet, but it will be, right? <gasps> There's my Adrian. Good morning, my Adrian. And Mr. Ken, good morning, guys. Tomorrow will be Thursday. All right. Tomorrow will be Thursday. Hello to all my sweet Burmese friends out there. My sweet English students, thank you all for joining. All right. So let's see here. Um, Let's see. Oh, prayer focus. Let's look at our prayer focus real quick. Today, our prayer focus is patience and trust. Can you see that? Now, these prayer cards are from the Daily Grace Company, and it says, pray that God would bear the fruit of patience in our lives. Pray that we would trust God and his plan so that we can wait patiently whenever needed. Pray that we would be patient with those around us. That's a good reminder we all need. Remembering God's patience and kindness towards us. So if God is patient with us, well, we should be patient with others, shouldn't we? That's a great prayer focus for today. Now, while we finish our calendar, if you have some prayer requests, go ahead and put those in the comments so we can add them to our prayer time today, okay? All right, I just wanted to interject that to get you thinking about prayer time. All right, so let's go back over here. If today is Wednesday, we need a number, and we established that today is Wednesday over here. It's winter time, it's cold and Sunday, sunny, not Sunday. And today is Wednesday, so we need a number. May we count together? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's right, we need our nine. And I just had my nine. Where did I put it? Oh boy, oh, it's right here. <laughs> Stuck it right where I'd know where it was. Don't you love it when that happens? Okay, so today is February 9th. 2022 and it is Wednesday. Wednesday, February 9. Okay? Everybody good? All right. Now, let's see. Uh, let's go ahead and pray. Can we pray? Good night to shine. Oh, me too, Adrian. Me too. That's a great one to pray for, isn't it? All right. So, I need to clean my glasses. Here we go. Get your hands up. One little, two little, three little fingers. Four little, five little, six little fingers. Seven little, eight little, nine little fingers. Ten little fingers. Folded in prayer. Bow your heads and close your eyes and let's pray. Dear God, thank you so, so much for this day. Lord, I praise you and I thank you for the sun shining and the birds chirping. And I thank you, Lord, for all my chapel friends. I thank you for Tony and Lizzie, that they get to be a part of our chapel. And I thank you for Frederick, our little fox puppet coming today. And Lord, I thank you for our many, many blessings. I thank you that we can connect online and be able to have chapel, even when we can't be together in person. So Lord, just bless our time together. May our Bible story today be such a blessing and, and bring you glory, God, because that's what it's all about. Lord, I do pray that, that I can be more patient with those around me, Lord. And Lord, I, I pray that I will trust you more every step of the way. Lord, I, I thank you for that reminder this morning for, for patience and trust. And Lord, I do pray right now for our Night to Shine event. It's just a few days away. Lord, I pray for our honored guests and their caretakers that will be coming. And Lord, I pray for all the volunteers. Lord, I pray for good weather. And Lord, I want to pray that while we have good weather, maybe the sun won't shine so bright so that they can see all the beautiful lights that we have put up. And, and Lord, I, I just know it's going to be a blessing to them. But Lord, I know even more, it's going to be a blessing to us to be able to serve them. And so, Father, thank you for the opportunity. And God, just may your name be glorified through it all. Lord, um, bless our time in chapel today. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let's see. 
Let's see. What shall we do now? We shall do we shall do our Bible story, don't you think? All right. So I'm going to get out our devotional. Let's see where we're at today in our I am devotional. Oh boy. So the last time we were together, we talked about marching around Jericho, right? They marched seven times and the walls came tumbling down. Remember that? Okay. So the name for God that we're going to study today is Jehovah. Everybody say Jehovah. Shalom. Shalom. Now you say Shalom. L-O-M-E, the Loam pronunciation, is the all caps part. That means it's with more force, right? Shalom. Got it? So Jehovah, Shalom. In Jehovah, the accented part of the pronunciation is the Ho. Jehovah. Hear that? Jehovah. Hear how it's stronger? Jehovah, Shalom. Yes. So here it is right here. Jehovah Shalom, and it means the Lord is peace. Oh, you know, I love that verse in the Bible that says, um, a peace that passes all understanding. God gives us a peace that we just can't even begin to understand, and we sure can't have it on our own. Mm -mm, no. All right, so let's see what our story about today. It comes from the book of Judges, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. So we're in the book of Judges in the Old Testament of the Bible. And it's chapter 6 and 7. So our devotion is going to give us a summary for that. And right here on this picture, do you see what it says? Everything comes from God. Hmm, let's see what it says. Turn on your listening ears. Judges 6, 24 says, Then Gideon built an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is Peace. I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river in my soul. Love that song. Huh. All right, here we go. The Israelites had promised to obey God, but they did not keep their promise. That's a big surprise, isn't it? They stopped worshiping him only, and they began to worship idols. Ugh. So God allowed the people of other lands to fight with them and cause them trouble. The people of Midian came with their camels and livestock and camped in tents throughout Israel. They ate all the crops that the Israelites had planted. The, um, the Israelites left their homes and they went to hide in mountains, in dens, and in caves. Finally, Hear that? Finally, they cried out to God and asked God for help. So here's God. He's done all this for them. Kind of sounds like us a little bit. He's done all this for them. He's brought them out of slavery. He's provided food from the sky and water from the rock. I mean, he's done everything he could possibly do to show them how faithful he is. Yet, there they are worshiping idols and sinning against him. The Midianites come in, they take the Midian, the Midians, they, they came in and they ate all their food and they, <laughs> they were just kind of taken over to the point that the Israelites had to go hide. And then it says, finally, they called out to God. See, we do that, don't we? We get so wrapped up in what's going on in our world that sometimes we forget to even call out to God, knowing that he's listening, knowing that he's almighty, knowing that he's faithful and will provide. But see, we just get so caught up in doing it our way. I'm going to do me, right? I'm going to do what I want to do. That just like them, finally they called out to him. Oh, let's see what happened. One day, while Gideon was trying to hide some wheat from the Midianites, he suddenly saw someone who said to him, The Lord is with you, mighty man. Hmm. Gideon felt small and, well, not mighty at all, really. If God is with us, he asked, why have all these bad things been happening to us? We need God to help us. Hmm. Hmm. I am sending you to save your people from the Midianites, the visitor said. You know who the visitor was? It was an angel from the Lord. How can I save Israel, Gideon wanted to know. God will be with you, the angel said. Can you show me a sign that this is true? I mean, since he hasn't shown you already. Now, please wait here while I go and get a gift for you. When Gideon brought him the food, oh wait, the angel waited while Gideon cooked a meal of meat, bread, and broth. 
When Gideon brought him the food, the angel said, Put the meat and bread on this rock and pour the broth over it. Gideon did what the angel said. Then the angel touched the food with the tip of his staff. Psh, fire sprang up from the rock. The food was gone. And so was the angel. Can you imagine Gideon's face, <laughs> right? It really was God's angel talking to me, Gideon said, feeling a little afraid. God answered him, don't worry, Gideon. Be at peace. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord and called it, The Lord is Peace. God told Gideon, pull down the altars built for idols. Gideon obeyed God, but he did it at night because he was afraid of his family and the people in his town. They were angry. God protected him. Then Gideon called for men to gather with him to fight the Midianites. And many Israelites came. Oh, there are too many, God said. This is my battle, not yours. God chose just 300 men. Gideon divided the men into three groups surrounding the Midianites' camp. He gave each man a trumpet and a torch inside of a clay jar. When Gideon blew his trumpet, all the soldiers blew theirs too and smashed their jars so that the torches could be seen. Instead of fighting with the Israelites, the frightened Midianites ran away. Look at that. Look at how God provided. So there he is. All right. Dear God, I'm glad you forgive me and help me and give me peace. Thank you for Jesus. Amen. So what does this all mean? What does this story mean to us? How can we apply it to our life? Here we go. Have you ever tried to work a puzzle with pieces missing? How did you feel when you couldn't find the missing piece? Or maybe you couldn't finish the puzzle. Later, if you found the missing pieces and finished the puzzle, well, how did you feel then? That's a pretty good feeling, isn't it? When you finish a puzzle, it is whole, complete. The picture in the puzzle is how it should be. Peace is a feeling of being whole. God wants to fill in our missing pieces, make us whole, and give us peace. One of God's names in the Bible is the Lord of Peace. Do you remember what it is? Jehovah Shalom. When we do something we know is wrong, well, we don't have peace, do we? No, we have this ugh, feeling inside and it's like a burden on our shoulders. But because Jesus died for our sins, God forgives us and gives us peace. So then that weight is lifted in that ugh, inside, that bad feeling, well, it goes away. Sometimes, like Gideon, we may have a problem that worries or frightens us. Maybe somebody in our family is sick, or maybe we have a hard spelling test coming up, or maybe someone at school is not being so nice to us. Maybe mom and dad have been arguing, or, or maybe dad's deploying, or I don't know, maybe you're struggling with your schoolwork. Because God is with you and helping you, you can have peace no matter what's going on. God is there. And he can bring you peace, but see, then we have to count on him for that, right? John 14, 27 says, Jesus said, my peace I give to you. That's that peace that passes all understanding. Bigger than we can understand. But we can have that peace through Jesus, see. When we accept Jesus as our personal Savior, when we commit our life to him and and we put him first in our life, and we lean on him for, for our, our um, when we have a question or when we need things, when we, when we trust him and not things of the world, then we can have that peace. Even in the rough times, even in the scary moments, even in the moments that are sad, we can still have peace because peace comes from God. And, and when he lives inside of our lives and when, when he's the when he's the redeemer of our heart, when the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, we can have that peace, even in the roughest moments. Pretty cool, huh? He must love us real big, hadn't he? So here's the torches. There's the lanterns that they broke, you know, busted, blowing their trumpets. See that? 
And boy, those Midianites, they just took off running. It scared them so bad. See, God provided a way. They didn't even have to fight. Yeah. All right. Well, that's our devotion for today. What, what, what an encouraging word, right? Encouraging that we can have peace because we have Jesus. Um. All right. Let's see. Are we ready for our Narnia story now? Okay. Let's see if they're having peace today. Hmm. All right. Chapter 10. The Hermit of the Southern March. Now, remember when we left off. Now, for those of you that are just joining us, let me tell you this. This is the Chronicles of Narnia from C.S. Lewis. These are not true stories. Okay? C.S. Lewis made up these stories, but there's little nuggets that, that point us to Jesus all throughout these books, which is why we're reading them. So, <clears throat> when we left off, Let's see what had just happened. Oh, they had gotten to a, a place where there was a cool river. Oh, because they had been going through the desert, right? The two talking horses from Narnia and the two kids. All right, let's see what this says. And I won't keep you long. We'll read just a few pages and then we can finish it up later. After they had ridden for several hours down the valley, it widened out and they could see what was ahead of them. The river, which they had been following here, joined a broader river, wide and turbulent which flowed from their left to their right, toward the east. Beyond this new river, a delightful country rose gently in the low hills, ridge beyond ridge, to the northern mountains themselves. To the right, there were rocky pinnacles, one or two of them with snow clinging to the ledges. To the left, <clears throat> pine-clad slopes, frowning cliffs, narrow gorges, and blue peaks stretched away as far as the eye could reach. He could no longer make out Mount Pyre. Straight ahead, the mountain range sank to a wooded saddle, which of course must be the pass from Arkenland into Narnia. Brew-hoo-hoo, the north, the green north, neighed Bree, and certainly the lower hills looked greener and fresher than anything that Erebus and Shasta, with their southern bred eyes, had ever imagined. Spirits rose as they clattered down the waters, meet of the two rivers. The eastern flowing river, which was pouring from the higher mountains at the western end of the range, was far too swift and too broken with rapids for them to think of swimming it. But after some casting about up and down the bank, they found a place shallow enough to wade. The roar and clatter of water, the great swirl against the horse's fetlocks, the cool stirring air, and the darting dragonflies filled Shasta with a strange excitement. Friends, we are in Arkenland, said Bree proudly as he splashed and churned his way out of the northern bank. I think that river we've just crossed is called the Winding Arrow. I hope we're in time, murmured Wynn. Then they began going slowly and zigzagging a good deal, for the hills were steep. It was all open, park-like country, with no roads or houses in sight. Scattered trees, never thick enough to be a forest, were everywhere. Shasta, who had lived all his life in the almost treeless grassland, had never seen so many or so many kinds. If you had been there, you would probably have known, even though he didn't, that he was seeing oak trees and beech trees and silver birches and rowans and sweet chestnuts. Rabbits scurried away in every direction as they advanced, and presently they saw a whole herd of fallow deer making off among the trees. Isn't it simply glorious, said Erebus. At the first ridge, Shasta turned in the saddle and looked back. There was no sign of Tashban. The desert, unbroken except by the narrow green crack which they had traveled down, spread to the horizon. Hello, he said suddenly. What's that? What's that? said Bree, turning around. When and Erebus did the same. Erebus did the same. That, said Shasta, pointing. It looks like smoke. Is it a fire? Sandstorm, I should say, said Bree. Not much wind to raise it, said Erebus. Oh, exclaimed Wynne. Look, there are things flashing in it. Look, there are helmets and armor. Armor, and, and it's moving this way. By Tash, said Erebus, it's the army. It's Rabidash. Oh, no. Of course it is, said Wynn. Just what I thought of. Quick, we must get to, to Anvard before it. 
And without another word, she whisked around, began galloping north. Bree tossed his head and did the same. Come on, Bree, come on, yet Erebus over her shoulder. This race was very grueling for the horses. As they topped each ridge, they found another valley and another ridge beyond it. And though they knew they were going in more or less the right direction, no one knew how far it was to Angard. From the top of the second ridge, Shasta looked back again. Instead of dust cloud well out in the desert, he now saw a black moving mass, rather like ants, on the far bank of the winding arrow. They were doubtless looking for a ford. They're on the river, he yelled wildly. Quick, quick, shouted Erebus. We might as well not have come at all if we don't reach Anvard in time. Gallop, breed gallop. Remember, you're a war horse. It was all Shasta could do to prevent himself from shouting out similar instructions, but he thought, the poor chap's doing all he can already, so he held his tongue. And certainly both horses were doing, if not all they could, all they thought they could, which is not quite the same thing. Bree had called up with Wynne, and they thundered side by side over the turf. It didn't look as if Wynne could possibly keep it up much longer. At that moment, everyone's feelings were completely altered by a sound from behind. It was not the sound they had been expecting to hear, the noise of hoofs and jingling armor and mixed perhaps with calamine battle cries, yet Shasta knew it at once. It was the same snarling roar he had heard that moonlight night, moonlit night when they first met Erebus and when. Bree knew it too. His eyes gleamed red and his ears lay flat back on his skull, and Bree now discovered that he had not really been going as fast, not quite as fast as he could. Shasta felt the change at once. Now they were really going all out. And in a few seconds, they were well ahead of when. It's not fair, thought Shasta. I did think we'd be safe from lions here. He looked over his shoulder. Everything was only too clear. A huge, tawny creature, its body low to the ground, like a cat streaking across the lawn to a tree when a strange dog has got into the garden, was behind him. And it was nearer every second and every half second. He looked forward again and saw something which he did not take in or even think about. Their way was barred by a smooth green wall about ten feet high, and in the middle of that wall there was a gate open. In the middle of the gate stood a tall man, dressed down to his bare feet in a robe colored like autumn leaves, leaning on a straight staff. His beard fell almost to his knees. Shasta saw all this in a glance and looked back again. The lion had almost got wind now. It was making snaps at his hind legs, and there was no hope now in her foam-flecked, wide-eyed face. Stop, bellowed Shasta in Bree's ears. Must go back, must help. Bree always said afterward that he never heard or never understood this. As he was, in general, a very truthful horse, we must accept his word. Shasta slipped his feet out of the stirrups, slid both his legs over on the left side, hesitated for one hideous hundredth of a second, and jumped. It hurt horribly and nearly, winded him. But before he knew how hurt, um, how it hurt him, he was staggered back to help Erebus. He had never done anything like this in his life before and hardly knew why he was doing it now. One of the most terrible noises in the world, a horse's scream, broke from Wynne's lips. Erebus was stooping low over Wynne's back and seemed to be trying to draw her sword. And now all three, Erebus, Wynne, and the lion, were almost on top of Shasta. Before they reached him, the lion rose on its hind legs, larger than you would have believed a lion could be, and jabbed at Erebus with its right paw. Shasta could see all the horrible claws extended. Erebus screamed and reeled into the saddle. The lion was tearing her shoulders. Shasta, half mad with horror, managed to lurch toward the brute. He had no weapon, not even a stick or a stone. He shouted out idiotically at the lion as one would a dog, Go home! Go home! For a fraction of a second, he was staring right into the wide-eyed, raging mouth of the lion. Then, to his utter astonishment, the lion, still on his hind legs, checked itself suddenly, turned head over heels, picked up, and rushed away. Wow. Shasta did not for a moment suppose it had gone for good. He turned and raced for the gate in the green wall, which now, for the first time, he remembered seeing. When, stumbling and nearly fainting, was just entering the gate. Erebus still kept her seat, but her back was covered with blood. Come in, my daughter, come in, the robed and bearded man was saying, and then, come in, my son, as Shasta panted up to him. He heard the gate close behind him. 
and the bearded stranger was already helping Erebus off her horse. They were in a wide and perfectly circular enclosure protected by a high wall of green turf, a pool of perfectly still water, so full that the water was almost exactly level with the ground, lay before them. At one end of the pool, completely overshadowing it with branches, there grew the hugest and most beautiful tree that Shasta had ever seen. Beyond the pool was a little low house of stone roofed with deep and ancient thatch. There was a sound of bleeding, and over at the far side of the enclosure, there were some goats. The level ground was completely covered with the finest of grass. Are, are, are you, panted Shasta, are you King Loon of Arkenland? The old man shook his head. No, he replied in a quiet voice. I am the hermit of the Southern March. And now, my son, waste no time on questions, but obey. The damsel is wounded. Your horses are spent. Rabidash is at this moment finding a ford over the winding arrow. If you run now without a moment's rest, you will still be in time to warn King Loon. Shasta's heart fainted at these words, for he felt he had no strength left, and he writhed inside at what seemed the cruelty and unfairness of the demand. He had not yet learned that if you do one good deed, your reward usually is to be set to do another and harder and better one. But all he said out loud was, Where is the king? The hermit turned and pointed with his staff. Look, he said, There is another gate, right opposite to the one you entered by. Open it and go straight ahead, always straight ahead, over level or steep, over smooth or rough, over dread or wet or dry. I know by my art that you will find King Loon straight ahead. But run, run, run. Always run. Shasta nodded his head, ran to the northern gate, and disappeared beyond it. Then the hermit took Erebus, who he had all this time been supporting with his left arm, and half led, carried her into the house. After a long time, he came out again. Now, cousins, he said to the horses, it is your turn. Without waiting for an answer, and indeed, they were too exhausted to speak, he took the bridles and saddles off of them, then he rubbed them both down so well that a groom in a king's stable could have not done it better. There, cousins, he said, dismiss it all from your minds and be comforted. Here is water and there is grass. You shall have hot mash when I have milked my other cousins, the goats. Sir, said Wynne, finding her voice at last, will the Tarquina live? Has the lion killed her? I who know many present things by my art, replied the hermit with a smile, have yet little knowledge of things future. Therefore, I do not know whether any man or woman or beast in the whole world will be alive when the sun sets tonight. But be of good hope. The damsel is likely to live as long as any her age. When Erebus came to herself, she found that she was lying on her face on a low bed of extraordinary softness in a cool, bare room with walls of undressed stone. She couldn't understand why she had been laid on her face, but when she tried to turn and felt the hot, burning pains all over her back, she remembered and realized why. She couldn't understand what delightfully springy stuff the bed was made of because it was made of heather, which is the best bedding, and heather was a thing she had never seen or heard of. The door opened and the hermit entered, carrying a large wooden bowl in his hand. After carefully setting this down, he came to the bedside and asked, how do you find yourself, my daughter? My back is very sore, father, said Erebus, but there is nothing else wrong with me. He knelt beside her, laid his hand on her forehead, and felt her pulse. There is no fever, he said. You will do well. Indeed, there is no reason why you should not get up tomorrow. But for now, drink this. He fetched the wooden bowl and held it to her lips. Erebus couldn't help making a face when she tasted it, for goat's milk is rather a shock when you're not used to drinking it. But she was very thirsty and managed to drink it all and felt better when she had finished. Now, my daughter, you may sleep when you wish, said the hermit, for your wounds are washed and dressed, and though they smart, they are no more serious than if they had been the cuts of a whip. It must have been a very strange lion, for instead of catching you out of the saddle and getting his teeth into you, he was only drawn his claws to your back, ten scratches, sore, but not deep or dangerous. I say, said Erebus, I have had luck. 
Daughter, said the hermit, I have now lived a hundred and nine winters in this world and have never yet met any such thing as luck. There is something about all of this that I do not understand. But if ever we need to know it, you may be sure that we shall. And what about Rabidash and his hundred horses? asked Erebus. They will not pass this way, I think, said the hermit. They must have found a ford by now well to the east of us. From there, they will try to ride straight to Anvard. Poor Shasta, said Erebus. Has he far to go? Will he get there first? There is good hope of it, said the old man. Erebus lay down again on her side this time and said, Have I been asleep for long? It seems to be getting dark. The hermit was looking out the only window which faced north. This is not the darkness of night, he said presently. The clouds are falling down from the storm this head. Our foul weather always comes from there in these parts. There will be thick fog tonight. Next day, except for her sore back, Erebus felt so well that after breakfast, which was porridge and cream, the hermit said she should get up. And of course, she at once went out to the peak to the horses. The weather had changed and the whole of the green enclosure was filled like a great green cup with sunlight. It was a very peaceful place, lonely and quiet. Wynne at once trotted across to Erebus and gave her a horse kiss. But where's Bree? said Erebus, when each had asked after each other's help and sleep. Over there, said Wynne, pointing with her um, horse nose to the far side of the circle. And I wish you'd come and talk to him. There's something wrong. I can't get a word out of him. They strolled across and found Bree lying with his face toward the wall, and though he must have heard them coming, he never turned his head or spoke a word. Good morning, Bree, said Erebus. How are you this morning? Bree muttered something that no one could hear. The hermit says that Shasta probably got to King Loon in time, continued Erebus, so it looks like as if all our troubles are over. Narnia at last, Bree. I shall never see Narnia, said Bree in a low voice. Aren't you well, Bree dear, said Erebus. Bree turned round at last, his face mournful, as only a horse's can be. I shall go back to Calanon, he said. What, said Erebus? Back to slavery? Yes, said Bree. Slavery is all I'm fit for. How can I ever show my face again? The free horses of Narnia. I who left a mare and a girl and a boy to be eaten by lions while I galloped all I could to save my own wretched skin. We all ran as hard as we could, said Wynne. Shasta didn't, snorted Bree. At least he ran in the right direction. He ran back. And that is what shames me most of all. I, who call myself a war horse and boasted of a hundred fights to be beaten by a little human boy, a child, a mere foal, who had never held a sword nor had any good nurture or example in his life. I know, said Erebus. I felt just the same. Shasta was marvelous. I'm just as bad as you, Bree. I've been snubbing him and looking down on him ever since you met us, and now he turns out to be the best of us of all. But I think it would be better to stay and say we're sorry than to go back to Calamon. It's all very well for you, said Bree. You haven't disgraced yourself, but I've lost everything. My good horse, said the hermit, who had approached him unnoticed because his bare feet made so little noise on that sweet dewy grass. My good horse, you've lost nothing but your self-conceit. No, no, cousin, don't put back your ears and shake your mane at me. If you are really so humbled as you sounded a minute ago, you must learn to listen to sense. You're not quite the great horse you had come to think from living among poor dumb horses. Of course, you are braver and cleverer than them. You could hardly help being that. It doesn't follow that you'll be anyone that you'll be any, I can't even read the last part. It doesn't follow that you'll be anyone very special in Narnia, but as long as you know you're nobody very special, you'll be very decent sort of horse on the whole and taking one thing with another. And now, if you and my other forfeited cousin will come round to the kitchen door, we'll see about the other half of that match. We read the whole chapter. That was pretty fast, wasn't it? Wow, what a good story. Ha! Huh. Now, let's look at our biblical parallels real quick. We're almost done. Let's see where we can find Jesus in this. Let's see. The Hermit of the Southern March. It says in Galatians 6, 9, Let us not become weary in doing good. 
for at the proper time we will reap a harvest harvest if we do not give up. So here are biblical principles. Shasta is discouraged by the increasing difficulty of his experiences. Every task he undertakes is much harder than the previous one. But this is the process that leads to maturity. 1 Peter 4.12 says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial that you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. 1 Peter 1, 6-7 explains, Now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine. You know, we got to go through trials to be able to grow closer to God. You know, and we should praise Him even for the trials. All right, second biblical parallel. Scripture warns that pride goes before a fall. That's Proverbs 16, 18. Bree is bitterly ashamed of himself, but the hermit urges him not to wallow in self-pity. Instead, he can choose to learn from this experience. He who listens to a life-giving rebuke will be at home among the wise. Whoever heeds correction gains understanding. That's in the book of Proverbs, chapter 15, verses 31 to 32. 1 Peter 5, 6 advises, Humble yourself, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. So check this out. Erebus attributes her narrow escape to luck. The hermit says that in 109 years, he has never met any such thing. Who is right? Which one of them is right? According to the Bible, who or what controls the circumstances of our lives? Is luck really a thing or is God in control? Well, here's where your hint can be found. Psalm 75, 6 to 7 and Proverbs 16, 4 and 9. Now, as always, um, if you can answer our challenge question, this is from our Family Guide to Narnia by Christian Ditchfield. If you can answer who is right, is the hermit right that says there's no such thing as luck? Or is Erebus right that says, well, she was near, she had a narrow escape to luck? If you can answer that question based on those scriptures and send it to me in a message or a video, a prize will be on the way to you in the mail. Okay, but it's got to be based on those scriptures. I want to hear it from the scripture. Okay, guys? All right, so that wraps up our chapel time today. Woo! Now, don't forget, Friday is night to shine, so I'll be recording and posting at some point because we won't be live Friday morning because I'll be blowing up balloons and doing all kinds of stuff to get ready. Um, come and join us. Hey, if you have any kind of costumes, not scary, gory ones, but like princesses or superheroes, or if you have any kind of costumes, come to night to shine. You need to be there no later than 3.30 and if you're, um, so that you can be in line before our first guest arrives. I'd love for you all to come and be a part of that with us on Friday. I love you guys. There's my kiss in hand. Now go and let's be united in the passionate pursuit of the next generation. I love you guys. Bye. Come on, Frederick. We got work to do.